Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this beautiful sunny spring day. I am so happy to present our Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative second webinar uh, entitled Rhode Island's Unique Commercial Shellfishing Industry. Our guest presenters are the esteemed Michael McGivney, who's the president of the Rhode Island Shellfishmen's Association and in black on your screen in the black shirt and in white in the white corner <laughs> we have connor mcmanus who's principal biologist for the rhode island department of environmental management or dem and they are going to speak about the ways the wonderful ways over time and, and continuing that the state has been working alongside the shell fishermen um, on various projects and initiatives and it's really a unique and wonderful thing so before we begin, I just want to give a plug. This is brought to you by our ongoing Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative, uh, a, a sort of part of a, of a national set of shellfish initiatives, which really honors the legacy and role shellfish play in all sorts of aspects of our lives, um, from, from environmental improvement to family traditions, and certainly to our economy, to our vital, uh, vibrant industries. This initiative is a partnership of government, business, academia, and community groups. Uh, listed here below and, and it's uh, part of how we can strengthen our state's shellfish management practices and promote growth. So before I turn it over, I just want to prime that this is um, a very informal conversation. We're trying a new style. We have a, a PowerPoint presentation to guide the conversation and guide the topics, but this is uh, in true spirit of uh, DEM and the shellfishermen's working relationships. It, they, they have been, uh, they do work closely side by side. So this is Going to be a conversation uh, amongst and between Connor and Mike, and and please feel free to, to put in some questions along the way. We'll be dedicated time to that. So uh, enjoy our, our informal uh, but very informative uh, presentation on uh, shellfishing in Rhode Island. With that, guys, go right ahead. Mike, tell us a little bit about the industry. Well, thanks for having us, Azure. Uh, shellfishing has been part of Rhode Island since Rhode Island was about Rhode Island. Uh, the Indians used it for food, they, they harvest them, fed the pigs, various things. But it wasn't until uh, the late 1800s that uh, shellfishing really became an economic driver for the state. Uh, it was 1896, I tell the story of my great-great-grandfather, Herbert Rice, who took his scallop boat and all its implements to the Chicago World's Fair to show the world, the kings and potentates of the day, uh, mm -hmm. renowned ingenuity. So back then, that was a, a big commercial business, and it was very popular and productive. Uh, later on, we had oyster farming that was part of the day, and but it wasn't really until after World War II that the, the shellfish industry, as we know it, kind of developed, where the, the leases had gone, gone south for various reasons, and what was left was uh, an area that, that people coming home from the war could, could go and make some money at. So it really was the 40s and 50s that that uh, really got the, sh the shellfish industry on the map, the quahog industry. And uh, back then in the 50s, where it was so popular that they were uh, represented by the United Mine Workers. Uh, my great, my, my uncle, great uncle, Jimmy Rice, my godfather, he was actually the, uh, the head guy for the association back then. And it was, a, it was a lot more controversy going on. There was a lot of, with the union, there was strikes and, all sorts of warfare on the bay and stuff. Uh, but fortunately that has all come and gone and into the 60s and 70s, it's now what we have as a, a modern fleet. Uh, the equipment improved to the point where we can go out in any weather, you know, in the winter time. Uh, the market developed, so we became an important player in, in the shellfish industry. And that's really when my association first uh, came, came to being was in the late 70s. Uh, it was because the largest shellfish dealer, who was also part of that union back in the day, wanted to decide depurating clams in the wintertime because the, uh, they couldn't get enough clams for the market because of the, the harsh winters we used to have back then. So uh, my group formed and basically we, we said that, hey, let's have transplants and let's move product from the, the thick coves that we have and move them to you know, areas we can work in the wintertime that we literally could dig holes in the ice with chainsaws and, and, and harvest them. And that's pretty much when I first started in the late 70s and early 80s. And that's uh, basically the beginning of the transplant program and, and basically helping to, to, to you know, improve the economy of the state and the, uh, the shellfish industry 
by using these, these tools that we have to uh, access the resource. What does the industry look like now, guys, in terms of, in terms of number of people and dollar value, all these sorts of things? Yeah, so it, you know, for commercial fishing, we probably have about 500 or so active shell fishermen with up to 1,500 fishermen that could in any given day fish for cohogs. Um, and typically over the last you know, five or six years, uh, landings have had about an X vessel value just over five million. So from a fishery standpoint, it's certainly a significant uh, source of the economy uh, for Rhode Island. And it, uh, when thinking about species, we have most of these organisms that are interstate, you know, migrate between mm -hmm. the state's waters. Quahogs are one of those unique ones that are Rhode Island only. There are, there are uh, or the Narragansett Bay quahog is only fished by Rhode Islanders. So when thinking about it uh, from a state perspective and a state only resource, uh, it, it's one of, if not the largest bay specific fishery um, that we have. Um, again, because other species are migrating in and out, we have uh, not only is, is the X vessel value high, but it's all from our bay. And really it's changed quite a bit since when I started, as far as the, the numbers have dwindled uh, quite a bit, but for uh, obvious reasons, when we first, I first started in, in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, the upper bay, the, the main area we fish now, had been closed because of uh, pollution problems. And that reopening really reignited the, the shellfish industry. It's when many of the people my age got in, into the industry, I, I was going to URI and you know, I heard the, I've always been down by the water and stuff, but I heard you can make some good money doing it. And basically we had a huge influx of young people back then with this new opening. And it also coincided with the New York um, collapse of their fishery. And we had hundreds of, of New York shellfish that came to the bounty that was the upper bay. So back then it was amazing. We'd have a thousand fishermen fishing the upper bay and we really dominated the market and, and the production. Uh, but understandably, you know, over time that number has, has dwindled. It couldn't sustain that kind of, that kind of uh, pulse of people. And we knocked it down where most of the people now are just our full-time fishermen have been doing it for quite some time. And I, I think to Mike's point, you see, certainly we think of the bay or uh, the bay Even within the bay, the fishing effort is just—it's not—it's spatially different. You know, I mean, it, you don't—you have the fishing effort tied to a number of things. One being where do quahogs live, where our abundance is high. You have, uh, and that's driven by the biology and the habitat characteristics that quahogs require. Um, then you have the other aspects, you know, for fishing. You know, at certain times of the year, certain areas. Mike can probably attest to this um, himself, but you know, where you can fish. And where it's easy to fish depends on the wind and the weather and where you can not get blown around a lot mm -hmm. and you know uh, the conditions in a given day and throughout the winter versus the summer and then ultimately too you know water quality you know and how that influences the management both in terms of just uh, permanently closed areas or those conditions are closed after a big rain event or you know, so there's certainly some interesting spatial patterns for both cohogs as well as the management strategy. And water quality really has been like the, the main driver in the changes that we've seen, whether it was the access to the upper bay, but even after that, the, the area that, that was so productive closed on a half inch of rain. And that, I can't tell how frustrating that is that, you know, you have a good week or two weeks and you're really doing well, and all of a sudden you have a, a large rainstorm and, and you get pushed back into an area that's not nearly as productive. So really, again, uh, over time, over the efforts by, you know, the Narragansett Bay Commission and the, the sewer tunnel, We've had greater access to the areas that were our most important beds. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, that you know area B, which is really an uh, important. Feel free to point too if it's helpful. Area B, which is Rocky Point, Connor. I mean that has lost its um, conditional area status, which means it's always open, and that has been such a great help to the industry because you know now that you know if. I've been doing this a long time, so I kind of know the up and downs, but if you're a young shell fisherman, it really helps to stabilize your income, you know, and a, and a job that's very difficult to do that. So water quality improvement's been the driver and really the, our lifeline to, to what we can access. Sure, and um, I think, you know, as Mike's described, the fishery history, kind of a bit of, to complement that, just a bit of overview for, you know, shellfish management. It's, as you can imagine, based on, 
this conversation thus far is quite intricate. You have many things going on from water quality to um, you know, trying to enforce management regulations to making sure that, that waters are, are, are certain criteria and that the shellfish themselves are of, of uh, proper condition for human consumption. And then from the biology point, how many can you take without a population collapsing? You know, and like what's, that, what's that population level that allows it to sustain itself through times and also maximizing the yield or fishing effort? Um, for the economy. So, you know, we, the, one, of, one of, if not the primary uh, shellfish managers for Rhode Island is DEM. And within that, we have a number of different uh, organizations or divisions that are critical to the success of shellfish management. Um, I myself am a part of the Division of Marine Fisheries, which is much uh, focused on the stock itself and the cohog population and answering those questions. Um, how many can one take while still making sure that there's cohog populations for future generations to be not just fished uh, commercially, but also for the public, you know, for people so we can continue the Rhode Island heritage of kids cohogging in, in Narragansett Bay and uh, the, also the eco ecosystem role that cohogs play in filtering water and as a conduit from phytoplankton to higher species that eat cohogs. So um, we kind of represent both the cohog as a resource to the ecosystem and to the recreational people of Rhode Island, as well as trying to make sure that there's a sustainable component uh, that can support the fishery. Um, and we do that through a number of different ways. We have pictured on our right here, um, our research vessel Clambo, uh, which we use to monitor the cohog population throughout Narragansett Bay, primarily the upper bay. And so we do standardized tows every year uh, to look at the abundance of cohogs uh, throughout the area. And really what we're trying to see are two things. Um, one, how does the abundance change through time from year to year? Is the abundance increased, decreased, stay the same? Um, and then also the size composition. Um, are cohogs getting bigger, smaller? Are we, you know, fishing down big ones? Are we fishing up little ones if there's a market demand for smaller size classes? So this is some of the data that we use to try and understand um, how the population has changed through time. Uh, so that's kind of the marine fisheries focus. Uh, from the water quality component, we work very closely with the Office of Water Resources uh, and specifically their shellfish program that are really focused on what Mike discussed earlier in terms of this water quality, trying to understand how um, water quality has changed through time, the current status of given areas, and whether these waters themselves are um, of a certain health standard that would support or allow for shellfish to be taken there while ensuring uh, the safety human consumption of shellfish. And that's, I think, one of, if not the most important things when we talk about, you know, the shellfish industry, because we want to make sure that, A, that the public health is, is ensured, but also that the brand of cohogs for Rhode Island is, is strong and remains strong. And so it's, these are, it's a critical component of our shellfish management for the state. Um, we work also a lot with the Rhode Island Department of Health in testing cohogs and, um, and trying to understand the, the different contaminants that may be in the water and uptaken by shellfish as filter feeders. So there's other people that help us as well um, in those efforts. Uh, and then of course, you know, there's other divisions within marine fisheries such as enforcement that really helps us, you know, take these management strategies presented by water resource and resources and marine fisheries to say, you know, how can we, you know, achieve our goals in a way that's actually feasible to make sure that um, regulations that are adhered to while still allowing for the, the management strategies to be success, successful and allow for an industry. Um, so there's you know multiple divisions within DEM itself trying to work together um, on this. And you know, kind of tying back to the shellfish initiative, you know, a lot of the help that we we get a lot of help from all different types of people, all of our research scientists, citizen scientists, industry members, um, nonprofit scientists from all over, you know, all over the state really dedicated towards trying to make sure uh, that shellfish, that, that the name of shellfish as a as a, as a species, as a food commodity, as a recreation are maintained. And a lot of the research and understanding that we have for shellfish is um, made possible by all different types of people. And um, as part of DEM, while many of us being sci direct scientists, we also have the management responsibilities to make sure that that science is conveyed to management practices that um, are helpful in, in, you know, in making, helping us make the, the proper decisions. The two, two of the main points, and it's really what my association's been involved with since you know the beginning, 
uh, was the resource. You know, you don't have an industry unless you have a healthy resource. So whether it's it's closing down the Greenwich Bay management area, we went to DEM back in the early 80s and said, listen, this area's been fished out, we'd like to close it and transplant into it, make it a healthier resource. To our transplant program that we work in to restock other areas, to even the spawner sanctuary that we we work with DEM to establish to make sure there's a, a large population in the bay that's not being touched. Because if you don't have the resource, you know you don't have an industry. Uh, the the second you know biggest thing is the quality of the shellfish, and we've always been up up in front and working with the health department, the various groups that you mentioned and whether it's a harvester regulations or vibrio control that we talked about, uh, whether it's, you know, the way we manage an area, you know, how, how we manage it. Uh, we've worked on bushel limits, getting back to the resource part, you know, with DEM to make sure that things don't get overfished. Mm -hmm. So really we understand as a group and, and the, the algae bloom that we had problems with recently really brought to the forefront how important it is to have the, the people trust the, the public trusts the product that they're getting and how important it is for the fishermen, you know, to be able to sell high quality shellfish. So really it's a, a work of a lot of different groups, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. with the industry, which is a great part of it. The industry has been there right yeah. along to make sure that, you know, it's healthy and it's, it's, it's well, you know, it's, it's in good shape. And we've really done a, a wonderful job, I think, over the years. We were just talking right before that there's just almost too many things to list in one one presentation of all the ways in which you're involved, you know, that span the sort of policy sphere, research sphere, the public good and culinary. So there's just so much. And, and today we really uh, can't talk about it all, but Mike and, and Connor are going to kind of hone in on these, this handful of really neat topics, many of which Mike has, has already primed and brought up. Um, so if you guys want to kind of introduce these these main topics. Um, so, I mean, Mike could probably attest that uh, we're probably in communication almost daily, definitely weekly on all various types of activities. Um, I think that in and of itself highlights the collaboration and communication between um, management and the industry. <clears throat> and as you can see from the list, again, and as Azure said, this is just a few of the different ways that um, industry and management are uh, in, intricately linked and uh, communicate often and collaborate um, most importantly. Um, and so we'll kind of walk through a couple of these, but, um, and I think, I, I mean, from my personal experience, I think as ecosystem changes and as the environment changes, um, we and, and as collaborations increase, we've only increased the number of ways that we partner and work together um, on various sectors. It's getting more and more complicated. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you just listed the, a bunch of the, you know, the, the, the things that we've worked on, the harvester education. The, the toughest part of my, my job as, as a president is trying to communicate to the fishermen, you know, the importance of this. Because so many times when you say, oh, you got to put tags in your bag, you know, to identify an area, and they just think it's one more regulation that, you know, they, they made up that they had to do. But, but hey, we're, because we're federally certified to have interstate shell fishing, we have to comply with what the federal government tell us. And they tell us we have to put tags in them. But there's also a, another reason that if there is a problem, which fortunately with the Vibrio issue, we've been very lucky. You know, it's, we're not in the, the states that are under the, the club or whatever. We, we've done very well there. It's to ex explain to the people that we need to do this. This protects you. So if we have a bad situation, we can identify the clams, where they came from. So this is really uh, helpful to you. The same thing with the harvester training. Uh, for a lot of them, it was kind of stuff everybody knew, but for those that don't, it's, it's a, a reminder that, you know, you gotta have good practices, you know, and sell your shellfish as quickly as you can and keep it out of the sun and all the things you do, best practices to, to make sure we can keep our, our good standing. Um, we, we work on all sorts of things. The shellfish advisory panel, which is where Con and I work together quite a bit. We evaluate aquaculture leases. So every aquaculture lease that's been in the state, there's over 70 of them, has been evaluated by both industry and, and by DEM. So it's, it's an ongoing, continuous, different things that we have to deal with. Some are being you know, hoisted upon us by the federal regulations, mm -hmm. but, but we understand that's part of the deal. And, and other things, and I think the, the algae bloom is a perfect example of the state stepping up, where they had an unprecedented uh, situation 
in, in the 40 years, I never we never had an issue that that was this concerning uh, with the closure of the bay. And but the way they they approached it, and they were very cautious, you know, and abundantly cautious to make sure the shelters were safe. Uh, they worked through that, and I think they've done a wonderful job. It's one of the best, uh, you know, things I've seen DEM do is collaborating, working with the various groups. So uh, there's just so much stuff that goes on, and we're just lucky that we're working so well with DEM now and the various groups. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the high global bloom? And uh, sure. Uh, so I think, as Mike said, it's, it's, it's probably one of the more prime examples of state collaboration towards a common goal and objective. Uh, within DEM, I mean, leadership at water resources and, and trying to understand how to move forward it's it everybody from everybody within DEM effectively if I made Janet Coit was just I think from the top down that's what I've learned over the years I, I think I have five directors I've worked with and really top down is what gets things going but uh, she does she, yeah she is great yeah <laughs> um no and I, I think again everybody understanding that how this I mean somewhat of an emergency right like you're really coming having to step up and figure out what's going on and sampling at all times of the day, day and night, driving, drop samples off, uh, DEM particularly, you know, really uh, a well-oiled machine when it came to sampling from marine fisheries going out and collecting samples, bringing them back, water resources helping process, bringing them DOH to get further tested, sometimes traveling out of state to get them to FDA, other FDA approved labs, uh, working with industry who would bring us back uh, certain cohog samples that we couldn't necessarily get to easily and readily because it's all about time mm -hmm. moving quickly in these emergency scenarios. Aquaculturists who had product who could share with us to try and figure it out, talking with dealers, uh, and then again other other people within the state. You know, URI, Roger Williams, uh, EPA, you know, NBC, all these people kind of stepping up to try and whether it's getting us samples or offering uh, help for long-term monitoring or, you know, people realizing not just, you know, the concerns with the malic acid produced by Pseudonychia, which is a species of uh, harmful algae, but also the, the economic effect and, the, you know, how it impacts shell fishermen and um, it's a significant industry for our island. So I think, you know, as Mike said, that's probably one of the most recent high profile collaborations towards the same same exact the learning curve on that was so steep for everyone especially DEM uh, we never had to deal with it uh, their health department was quick to, to, to you know stop <clears throat> sales uh, I think Maine had hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of recalls for their shellfish which is really harmful for your market to have to it's bad enough to be in the newspaper about a problem, but when you have to recall shellfish, uh, we didn't have that problem. And I, I think the state just did a wonderful job of, of assuring and, and, and open the grounds as quickly as everybody felt comfortable doing. I think it was a 10-day closure. And just the learning curve in those 10 days was, uh, was immense. So uh, it was just a great working together of all the groups. And we had, there was one in the fall of 16 and one in the winter spring of 17. So it was the work and effort that we put into trying to understand how to manage 2016 bloom was certainly useful right. when, we, when it came back up in 17. And so the other aspect of this is that I think the state itself and other research entities have realized the significance of what, of what this does, not just from an industry perspective, but the ecosystem that there's been tons of more research and effort to try to understand what the species are, why do they produce the, okay, the levels, that's the thing, the, you know, it, it turned out they probably didn't need to close as much as they did originally, but we didn't know, you know, what the standards were and what the percentage were. Uh, fortunately, for the most point, the, the, they were still below the Fed standards, but we really couldn't take a chance on that. And that's where I think DEM and the health department were just right on it, that, you know, until they truly understood what we were dealing with, and like you said, out-of-state testing and all the things that went with that, mm -hmm. you know, that we really were very cautious and, and I think we kept the good good name of the, the shellfish industry. And, we, and we, try to base, we try to base, you know, our management on the best available science. Mm -hmm. with, with HABs, oftentimes we don't know why they come up, why they show up, why they produce a toxin. Mm -hmm. one of the so what's HABs? Oh, sorry, harmful algal bloom. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah, I mean, what we when we think it's of the Montreal Canadiens, or something like that, <laughs> switch it to hockey. Okay. Uh, so uh, no, sorry, you don't. We don't quite understand totally their their biology. You know what 
whether they prefer the strain, it. how toxic the strains are. It seems like Maine yeah. is a much more toxic strain they have there. Or in the abundance isn't always correlated to how right. much demolic acid is in right. the water. Right. So, you know, where they are in the curve. Kind exactly. Of, yeah. So it's yeah. really hard to try and figure this out. And, you know, I think uh, it was a, not just learning experience for all of us in terms of um, logistics and how do we monitor, how do we sample, uh, how do we communicate, but then also the science. Like, I think we all quickly tried to learn as fast as possible what mm -hmm. pseudonychia is and <laughs> like what the health effects of demolic acid. You know, right? So, no, I think it's just one of the many examples of kind of D is management collaborating with industry. Um, and I think as, you know, Mike talked about earlier, you know, we've seen through time improvements in water quality, uh, particularly in the upper bay. And there are the pros of that is, is, from a shellfish industry standpoint, the open certain grounds uh, for shellfish to occur and most uh, prominently in recent times, in 2017, we had uh, what was traditionally conditional area B. Again, in that map, it's pretty much this section right here, kind of going across effectively. It was a conditional area, um, no longer is uh, considered a conditional area, still a tagging area where people were reporting mm -hmm. their landings from there, but it's not having this conditional closure, uh, and then with conditional A also having a different uh, threshold for rainfall uh, criteria for closure. So we've seen these improvements happen, and I think the, the uh, Mike probably touched it better than me, but the economic gain or benefit from that is, is uh, pretty profound, and it shows, that, it shows that our goals towards achieving water quality are also being met. Yeah, it just stabilizes the industry for us. Uh, area B has always been one of the most productive parts of the bay, but you used to lose that with an inch of rain. You know, you lose the upper bay with a half inch of rain, which you'd be surprised. You could have a summer storm come through and you'd be on a real nice roll, catching, doing really well, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, or you have some kind of spillage or something. So really getting the water quality improvement, stabilizing where we can work, maybe getting access to new grounds, um, you know, making management areas out of like Branch Bay and getting access to those during the winter time uh, through water quality improvements. It really, you know, it's been much helpful to keep the fleet healthy. That's the thing. It's hard to be a, a sustainable industry when you have so many drastic changes because of rainfall. You know, and I always like, imagine having a job where you're sitting there and you're watching it rain, you go, oh, I'm not going to make much money this week, you know. So this has been a great, and it's helpful to get the new young guys in because that's, you know, if they can see they can make a steady income as opposed to maybe a little more roller coaster, it, it helps them understanding that, you know, hey, it's not just the summertime, i got to make money in the wintertime too, and, and having these areas available is really critical. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, as Mike talked about earlier, I mean, the, the shellfish education, the harvester education program really ties into the concerns that, um, of Vibrio and trying to ensure that I mean, with most fishermen, uh, shell fishermen, we like, to, we, we like to think that almost all, if not all of them, are using the safe practices outlined and guided by FDA uh, to ensure safe product and that um, the shell, that cult Shellfish can be a nationally recognized product that people pay extra for Rhode Island Quahog, that it's something of historical significance and, you know, of uh, like a, a name brand, that, a high name brand for the shellfish itself. And I think going through some of these safe practices like the Harvester Education Program and other Vibrio control plans, it continues to ensure that um, that ensure that brand name. And then being proactive on it, it's really important. Uh, we weren't in the Vibrio Club, even though all the states around us were. And it was a, a high quality, what we have, deep water clams. I, I guess we don't harvest oysters in the summer, which is very, not wild harvest. It, it, we were lucky to be in that position. Uh, so we, even though it was recommended by the federal government we developed these plans, it wasn't being pushed on us due to uh, concerns or actual events. So we were kind of proactive, both the aquaculture industry and the, and the shellfish industry, to make sure that we put these in place to assure that we stay out of the club, hopefully, and that, that we continue to have the high reputation that we have, both with the federal government and knowing that we've always been one of the states that are right on, you know, and, and thank water quality and DEM for that, that we've always had very, but our bay is, 
it's, it's, it's kind of like science, but more art than science when they have to figure out what areas to close and how to close them, where the line goes, you know, how many days do you close up you know, an area, you know, to make sure the, you know, the, the, the they, they cleanse themselves. So really it's, it's a combination of, of knowing the rules and, and, and being proactive and, and it, doing stuff to make sure we're compliant. But, but basically, you know, it's, it's helpful for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, Mike's, we, we talked this a little bit about with the, with the harmful algal blooms and trying to understand, you know, use science to back, um, ultimately <coughs> and I think we can also see that from the, um, the actual stock of cohogs directly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, marine fisheries is really, um, we're really responsible for understanding the population trends of, uh, and statuses for different species and trying to then uh, reflect management to preserve those stocks sustainably for years to come. Um, quahog is no different than any other species in that regard, one of the species that we work hard to try and understand that. And I think as of late, you know, with the help of both, of, of, with the help of industry, Roger Williams University, Commercial Fisheries Research, Research Foundation, the quahog Research Fleet is one example where we've um, kind of took a different spin on citizen science and it's it's it, with the citizens being fishermen who are out there daily, eyes in the water, have, have uh, you know, a great experience with both cohogs as well as the different parts of the bay and uh, what standing stocks are. And so what this product does is try, try to not only, in my opinion, leverage um, you know, their expertise and their time in the water in terms of understanding local abundances of cohogs in space and time um, to get better estimates of cohogs, but then also, um, you know, together on the DEM side, help them help explain what we do in terms of why we sample long-term, why that's important, mm -hmm. why that certain data we collect is important, why um, certain, certain considerations need to be taken when developing a scientific research plan and how that data actually ends up getting used for um, a stock assessment for a given mm -hmm. species. And so this allows, you know, one way is, you know, as I, as I mentioned through this project, with them actually going out and looking through their catch and counting how many of the catch and standardizing how long they've towed for, looking at the size composition over or the market class composition for different cohogs. That is one way that they can quickly see the type of data that we need and why we need it to be used uh, in certain ways for the assessment. And then the other facet of this program being um, a, co a collaborative calibration study where we look to see with our traditional dredge, all right, what's its efficiency uh, in our long-term monitoring for over different types of sediment, over different types of depth, over different types of local abundances and cohogs, um, and then compare that to um, uh, what bull, rake, bull rakers will dig up, you know, when they're going in certain areas, or what if actually on scuba counting, how many are in a certain quadrat, or going on scuba and actually following the tracks to see how many might have been missed in sand versus mud versus silt versus clay, you know. Um, so I think this is just one, this is one of the more, um, I would say probably one of the bigger highlights for the co research collaboration as of late in terms of actual, like, you know, uh, officially funded research that then can be used to help inform us about the, the species in Narragansett Bay. And if there was a weakness in our relationship, you know, over the years was the basic sampling and, and what we saw out there and how we saw it. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to go to a, a symposium in South Carolina. I mean, we were very lucky in Rhode Island as far as the fishermen getting along with DEM. Uh, there was a man from the Chesapeake Bay and the scientists there, and they are at such odds fighting each other. And it wasn't really until they started slowly trying to work together and he had a great point. He said, if you both agree on the data, then it's, then it's much easier to go forward. You can disagree on what to do with the data, but if you both people, if everybody involved you know, agrees with the data, then that's, that's a really important thing. So having the fishermen do it, uh, it turns out we're in the 90-something percent efficiency rating. And, you know, uh, having us go in different areas, it, it's helped us out with the opening of Greenwich Bay. One year there was concern about the population there, and, and we went in and you know did our surveys and proved to be a little healthier than what they had thought. So that once again, that's another thing that I, I you know I work to try to explain to the fishermen that don't want to work with DEM or think it's you know you know anybody that's 
you know, regulate as a bad person, that no, we need this. This is helpful. It helps helps us going forward and, and whether opening up an area that you know we feel comfortable with, it's it's good that that DM feels comfortable with it too. So really this was I think a great move forward and the participants themselves, we have some really great guys doing it. You know, some were maybe more critical of how things were going. And, you know, I recommend that that gentleman go there and it's really helped because, you know, he's on the video now saying how important it is to, to work together. So it's, it's a, a change in, in relationship. It's a change in understanding and, and it's really helpful, a change with the fishing people and how they relate to DEM. And the communication between both and, and trying to highlight what, you know, what are the types of data well, that That's we what it's need. all about, really, the, the communications, yeah. you know, that we all are on the same page. And like I said, we might differ on, on what to do with it, but it's, we're all on the same page with the data. Well, and it, it, it's, I think it's, it's, it's instead of, it's also caused, like, you know, conversations about, well, why do you survey this way? Well, we have to do it because of this, 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 and that. And, oh, okay, I understand that. But what about that? Well, that might be somewhere we should, you know, move forward and try and refine and with your collaboration, we can do that, but we still need to fit within the confines of X, Y, and Z to make sure it's still scientifically valid data. So it's been, I think, a educational experience in both ways, you know, the shellfish too, you know, traditionally we don't, we, it's not a federally managed species where you have these big stock assessments and big review panels. And so much of what we're trying to do to improve the science is kind of move towards a more formal way to say, what are the trends, how, how's the population going? And so it's been, you know, not just a, a new approach to shellfish management, but also like an opportunity for us to share people, here's what the data look like, here are the trends that we're seeing, what do you think about it? And it's, a, it's, it's not a, I like to think it's a conversation where we'll say, here's what we see, here's what we think's going on. And, you know, just at our recent co-op workshops, well, what do you think? And then they say, well, you, we had a big landing year in this year and it, we would think that recruitment would have been higher two years prior to that. How come your data don't reflect that? So mm. if it, it kind of brings, you know, it allows us to think about the math, and the, the heavy math and statistical modeling that goes into it, but then also bring in some of the more um, like historically reported or anecdotal components to try and corroborate what we're seeing at the time. Mm. And I think that's... We're the eyes in the water. We, we've seen how it the, the changes the trends and stuff. And, and Yeah. Um, and I think one, one of the other components, you know, and more, it, this has been going on for quite some time, but I think more recently it's been a little bit revamped and, uh, you know, um, built up is uh, our, like our public enhancement seeding project, um, which, you know, Mike and others um, up in Warwick are, are heavily involved in, which, you know, we, you know, this, it's a, it's a uh, MOU or collaboration between RISA, DEM, um, and Roger Williams to try and, um, basically provide some type of oysters back out to the environment, you know, through upwellers and such um, to help, you know, uh, different facets of groups. One being commercial industry and in the winter times when the caches might be low for quahog and there might be oysters somewhere else. It's also helped with the public in trying to, you know, provide a natural resource that kids walking down the beach can pull up an oyster and say, uh, you know, and, and, and think about biology and what's going on just for recreation. Uh, and and for eating, um, uh, but I think this is one component that where we have people working together from just again for the, the public enhancement itself, and uh, it's not necessarily for it, in part for commercial viability, but also for recreation and um, just, you know kind of for the resource uh, enhancement, the culture of our island. Right. Um, we were fortunate in two thousand four. Uh, Senator Reed had an agriculture initiative, uh, and we were part of that, and we got a grant to. to build an upweller, which is a big dock that goes uh, you know, seed. We basically, mostly it was coal hogs from the very first 10, 12 years. Uh, we planted in various parts of the bay. Uh, we've also put, uh, I think, half a million clams in Point Judith Pond. And that was specifically to try to target the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. I always thought that this would be a perfect thing to, to match the state. That, you know, I would drive down the, the access road to Galilee and I'd see Connecticut, Massachusetts, all these people out of state going out and shell fishing. And I'm thinking, what a wonderful way to, to turn your, or our, our beautiful houses that, you know, we, that we rent, the beaches that people want to go to, you know, and the ability, you know, to, to go out and, and get, catch clams or get a clam bake that night. So that's always a part of it. And it's, it's a lot of fun. We're all volunteers. Uh, we work very much with Dale, Dr. Dale Levitt from Rodgers Williams University. They're our 
our educational match. We've gotten funding from various sources, uh, the Warwick Sewer Authority. We got a grant for a humanitarian award through them. Uh, certainly with DEM, we've been getting funding. We've had uh, funding when there's been an oil, I mean, a, a sewer spill up in Providence. And instead of just finding them, DEM will say, well, why don't you put some money towards a, a transplant or seeding? So we really see this as a tool to be able to try to, you know, repopulate areas. It was recently that we started switching to oysters because they're kind of more fun to grow. They, they grow really fast and, and uh, our clam population is pretty steady. So we're trying to rebuild what had been in the mid 90s an important part of our industry, which is the oysters. We had a, a huge boom in the mid 90s that really helped the fishermen out and brought a lot of money to the state. So it's fun, we volunteer, you know, we work at the Upweller. We've gotten various grants. Recently, we got one through LASA to, to help rebuild the uh, help Weller. And, you know, it's guys working all day and they still don't find the time to go in the afternoon and, and, and work on the, the project. So, And that's a big thing, too. I mean, commitment to, you know, the betterment of public enhancement and fishery. You know, like, as, you, as you said, most of these chief of industry members who are involved, you know, they're doing it because they mm -hmm. care and they want to see, a, you know, successful populations. I'm in point in my life where I, I'm just so happy and that I've been able to make a living on the day that you know that it's been such a wonderful life I've been able to have through this resource that you really have the idea that you want to help put some back you know you know make things better when you leave and this is just one of the small ways that you know transplants or just various ways to help bring back the resource and, and, and have the fishermen work towards them. And, and, I mean as Mike just noted uh, the transplants have had been uh, you know one of the more common through time collaboration industry and DEM, where depending on um, both funded and volunteer transplants in various parts of the bay, where cohog effectively transplant mean or relay meaning cohog move from one area to another, um, and sometimes they've been moved to different management areas to then allow for harvest in different times of the year. Sometimes they've moved been moved to the spawner sanctuary to uh, provide an additional biological benefit in the future. Uh, and keep those cohogs in an area where they might be spawning and releasing the larvae to other places that are open to commercial fishing, um, and then other areas where they're open to fishing in certain times of the year, and then allow, but they still, those areas through the maybe harsher winters and the weather still provide an opportunity to fish, um, and certainly like, such as parts of And, and it's, a, it's a resource that, that needs to be utilized. I mean, these areas are so dense that they're actually hurting themselves, and you're doing, if you can, take a 10 or 20% out of it, you're making them a healthy you know, population. And, and you know, the, what we've got been paid over the time has changed, but in the day we would get 10 cents a pound to, to harvest them. And then when you buy them, you know, sell them, then you get a dollar a pound. So it's a 10 time increase, you know, over the years for the state, for the fishermen, you know, it helps support, you know, for our licenses. You know, we have a pretty, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, not expensive, but it's, and this helps go towards that. If you participate in the transplant, it helps go towards your, your you can pay towards your license. So it's it's a wonderful thing. It's a win-win for the state, for the industry, for the resource. And that's really been one of the collaborations that we've worked with DEM over the years to, to run this. Uh, we brought Narragansett Bay Commission into the program when there was a kind of a problem with, with DEM and the, the paperwork part of it because there would be so many participants. That uh, they actually stepped up for us, and they would process the checks and work with DEM. You mentioned part of the MOU with them, so it's a collaborative effort and a really great program. We've cut back recently. The we had several years, four or five years, really robust transplants, really really robust. We had great funding, so we have cut back a little bit. We had one last year, but it's always an opportunity there, you know, funding and, and the resource to to, to <laughs> retap that and and replenish these areas. Yeah, it's certainly a balance, you know, trying to make sure, because when we think about these areas, we're typically moving them from closed areas um, due to water quality. And so, you know, as Mike said, one of the prevailing research hypotheses is that in these closed areas, a certain density of cohogs per square meter, they become, after that point, they become less fecund or less, you know, reproducing eggs and larvae and such, and it's actually uh, worse than being at some optimal level of density. And so, that's you know one of the prevailing hypotheses in trying to make sure uh, you know when we move the organisms, we also realize that these closed areas of high abundances do support. And they you know, they'll sit either or, you know over the summer they'll still we put them in so they they have 
six, seven, eight months to cleanse themselves, hopefully respawn, respawn in these areas. Yeah. Or as you mentioned, the spawner sanctuary. I like to just mention that one because we had gotten some federal money from the oil spill. I don't remember which one it was. And we established the high banks management area that we talked about. And we we're alternating the beds there. But we found out that the, the alternation wasn't working because one of the areas we chose wasn't really a good coal hogging area for us. Mm -hmm. But it was a good area as far as location of the bay. So that's when we approached DEM and said, listen, let's only have this one area that we, we harvest them, which is the area that we, you know, it's large and the bottom's correct. And this other area will turn into a spawner sanctuary and put them there and leave them there. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we put about seven or 800,000 pounds of clams in this area over the years. And it turned out now that we're getting more scientific down the road, they've been doing larvae stu uh, studies, which Roger Williams, I think Jeff was involved with it, we've been involved with it. That actually shows the area that we chose to be ideal for repopulating Greenwich Bay and the areas that we really need. So it, it was a win-win for us. We have an area that we, we set aside and it's protected and it's full of clams and hopefully it, it continues to, to do good things for the bay. Yeah, and so, I mean, happy to take questions and answers too, but just in case any of you uh, have other questions that we may not have hit on, there's plenty of resources online um, to try and learn more about quahogs, you know, what the state's role is in management and the science uh, for the species. And then um, if you have any questions regarding that type of information, feel free to contact me and, you know, Mike's, uh, Riza and you know what Mike is working on with, uh, with his group. It, um, there's also a lot of great information online through their website. And feel free to contact them as well. And I don't know how we're doing on time, but I do want to talk about the licensing issues in the state. Um, we've been working on that. It's always been an important part of, of figuring out how the, the population of the bay. And I think it was 06 when we had that major license changes, you know, where we brought in the various, we ch changed things around. And back then, you know, they wanted, when we first started working on it, they wanted to make all latent licenses, licenses that didn't have landings, you know, not, couldn't renew. And we saw the damage that caused in the lobster industry and all the, you know, problems that created. So we worked with DEM and said, no, we need to protect certain parts of it. And one was we, we made it so as long as you renewed your license, you could keep it. So a lot of people, that's a backup in case they lose their job or, or whatever. Uh, we had the student license, which is what I started in back in 1970-something, you know, a low-cost, you know, low-bushel limit student license that was open. Uh, as part of the, the shellfish management plan, one of the things that, that came out of that was to extend the availability of the student license to June. So that is one of the, the only license that is actually available now, right, you know, as we speak. And it's for people from, you know, in, in high school, Elementary school, I think it's 16 to 24, I think is the age group that, that is allowed. We also uh, wanted to keep the, uh, the over 65 free license. And uh, I can tell you there's a lot of over 65 people that pushed me to, to continue that. But basically, if you've been you know, doing this long enough, after you turn 64 and two thirds, uh, your license, shellfish license is free. Uh, the other part in, in working with DM that really has proved over the years to be very effective and helpful is the exit to entry ratio that we worked upon with the licenses. We did want to reduce the latent licenses. I think there was almost 900 of them just from the shellfishing alone back when we started. And we've gotten that number down to 450, you know, and, and that number over the years. And it was through attrition. And it wasn't through kicking people out. And in the beginning, we had a three to one exit entry where three people leave, one would come in. And we've been able to whittle that down to a one to one uh, so one out, one in. And the other great change is they now, DM now allows the shellfish to sell their business. So if they want to get out of it or and they can sell their license and business, so that's created a whole little opportunity for people to get in. Uh, there is a moratorium now, so you have to apply to get a shellfish license. We do have some licenses that are open, but the main core license is still a closed fishery. But we have, we established a, a, a three-tier process that people can apply to get a, a shellfish license. So through the various management groups, we've really tried to, to do it in a way that you weren't pushing people out, you know, but you're allowing it to grow within. So we're targeting young people through the shellfish license. 
Um, my group has an internship program that we're lucky to, to get through the LASA program, the Legislative Agriculture and Seafood Act. And basically, we're trying to get young people to come out and try the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a different world out there now with what boats cost and engines and, and what people are, are, are doing. It's, it's hard work. It's not for everyone. But we're certainly trying to replenish the, uh, the number of shellfish and the young people into the industry. Right. And just with a few minutes left, I would encourage everyone to check out uh, these website resources. There's a great video a short two-minute video of, of Mike and Connor um, talking about many of the things you heard today. Um, the Shellfish and Men's Association website has all sorts of uh, details and pictures about the things you've seen and heard heard today. Um, and also some of the we have a commercial we're running now spots. on, uh, on yeah. TV and ran it during Cool Hard Week. What channel? Uh, well, it's a, a multiple, yep. you know, like 26 channels that it runs through and it's part of the working with Cox Media. And uh, DEM is part of the seafood uh, marketing marketing money that they had. They contributed to run the commercial uh, for us. So it, we were able to do this commercial uh, with Lasser Grant. I mentioned Lasser uh, before. And we've been running it the past three years. To, it basically promotes the industry. It, it, you know, make sure it's local, you know, fresh and local just like us. That's the, the, the tag on it. And so, to Mike's point, too, from DEM, you know, the, you know, Department of Agriculture is also significant on the on the food component. You know, they really moved in yeah. in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Ayers and the department to really be promoting both the aquaculture and the, the, the wild harvesters and the value of round drum seafood mm -hmm. for the state and beyond. And we have the seafood marketing collaborative that we're part of. That they work. They they develop Quahog Week, which is a great. Um, if I may. I've been doing this 23 years, I guess, this year as a president, and I've never seen the commitment by the state in all the various things to, to improve the industry, to support the industry, to promote the industry, you know, whether it's the reaction to the, the algae bloom, to just the support that we see, you know, much more now than in the past. We, you know, in, in, there was times that we were always seemed to be at each other's, you know, that, getting along, but it really, and I can contribute direct to Coit to, to being the, the leader on that, that we really, I really feel the state cares about us and are working hard to promote us. Where in the past, I never, I had, sometimes I didn't think that. So I, it's really been a great change. And the, the shellfish management plan was just uh, icing on the top as far as the, the commitment of all the various people and, and, and trying to understand our issues and, and frankly, trying to get parts of DM to work together which had been a problem, you know, so just getting everybody kind of pulling the rope in the same way really, you know, has, has been a great, great change. Excellent. And there's some more great resources too at um, shellfishri.com. So that's another great place to find information about the shellfish initiative. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Mike or Connor um, and, and know that this webinar, audio, video, um, as well as the archive on Shellfish RI, check that out and we're very happy to have you both gentlemen thank you so much for your time thanks for having us thank you